We've talked about how to use the Bernoulli equation with um, large vessels and free jets. Let's talk about some other applications for it. I want to remind you about conservation of mass because this is often needed to solve Bernoulli type problems. It still applies for control volumes and you can use it to provide one more equation to solve your problem. So remember, we can either say the sum of the mass fluxes on a control volume have to equal zero, or for incompressible fluid, for un incompressible fluids, the sum of the flow rates have to be zero. For free jets, there's a detail of this I skipped over before, which I need to return to. When water exits out of a hole, it often actually contracts as it for, um, a little bit outside of the exit. So the size of the jet is actually smaller than the size of the hole. And this, this makes a difference when you're calculating flow rates, right? Because the flow rate is velocity times cross-sectional area. And what we really need is the area of the jet, not the area of the hole. So this, um, this phenomenon is called vena contracta. And we handle it with what's called a contraction coefficient, which is simply the ratio of the area of the jet to the area of the hole. Um, in the FE handbook, this is the table that they provide for vena contracta, and it has, has contraction coefficients for, for different types of, um, of openings. And you can see with tubes, and if, a, if an opening is well rounded, you will get no contraction at all. The other thing to think about, this is a minor detail, is you, when you pick Bernoulli points in free jets, you're really picking them in the vena contracta. If you pick it right at the hole, the pressure there actually isn't zero. There's, there's still some pressure that hasn't dissipated yet. Okay, let's do an example using these concepts. We've got a container with 20 holes in it, so sort of like a sieve and water is pouring in at a, at a certain flow rate. What happens if you, if you do this is it will start to fill and water will pour out of the holes and it will continue, the water level will continue to rise until it reaches some steady state where the flow out equals the flow in. This is steady flow and um, what we're asking in this problem is to find the height at which this steady flow occurs. So I'm going to use Bernoulli. I'm going to pick two points. Got a large tank and free jets. Those are obvious places to pick our Bernoulli points. Um, we write the Bernoulli equation at those two points. In the large tank, the pressure and the, uh, the surface of the large tank, the pressure and the velocity are zero. In the free jet, the pressure is zero. And I'm going to set the free jet as our datum, so set that equal to zero. And we get that same simple equation. The velocity in the jet is the square root of 2gh. We can use conservation of mass here. The flow in has to equal the flow out. It goes in one place and comes out 20 different holes. So it's 20 times the area of the jet, the area of each jet times the velocity of the, each jet. And then we can apply vena contracta. Um, we said these are abrupt holes, so we expect a contraction coefficient of 0.62 based on the FE handbook. All right, we can take those three equations and combine them all, and we end up with a single equation where we know everything except for h. So we can plug in those values and solve for h, and that gives us our answer of 4.14 meters. Okay, another thing that's useful is flow past orifices. As water flows down this pipe, if we connect a piezometer to it, what's going to happen is water is going to flow past, but water will rise up that piezometer up to a certain height. That height um, can be used to measure the pressure in the pipe itself. And we use that familiar equation which we derived way back in chapter 2, P equals gamma H. And that was really derived for static fluids, but it also applies to fluids moving with a free surface. And when you've got a piezometer like this open in the atmosphere, it counts, and the gamma H still works. Um,
finally, stagnation points are also very useful. This is kind of a strange concept. If you've got an object in a flow field, streamlines will pass around that object, and the flow will kind of get squished as it goes around that object. And you'll notice some go one, along one side, some go along another side. There's one streamline that goes right down the middle and smacks right into the object. That point where it collides is called the stagnation point, and the streamline itself is called the stagnation streamline, and it's defined as the line that divides streamlines that pass on each side of the object. And at that point, you get maximum pressure, because what happens in the flow field is all of the velocity stops and gets converted into a pressure head. If we write the Bernoulli equation at that point, since it's a stagnation point, the velocity is always going to be equal to zero. So this is another useful place to write the Bernoulli equation because it simplifies our equation. This is utilized in pitot tubes. So if these are two different manometers, one of them is um, our standard piezometer, and another one is a piezometer, but it's bent so that the tube is pointed in the direction of the flow field. And what happens is the front of that pitot tube becomes a stagnation point. And if we write the Bernoulli equation at those two points along that stagnation streamline, the elevations are the same, and the velocity is going to be zero at that pitot tube opening because it's a stagnation point. So what you can see is the pressure on the right-hand side of the equation has to increase because it includes both the pressure on the left-hand side and the velocity. So that pressure includes both the velocity head and the pressure head in that flow field. At both of those points, pressure is equal to gamma h. We can plug those into our Bernoulli equation and solve for velocity. And what we find is we can use these two tubes as a velocity measuring device. Our velocity is simple equal, simply equal to the square root of 2g and the difference in height between the two tubes. So this is a very useful way to measure velocity, which is, which is not something that's easy to measure in flow fields. These are often devised or put together in devices that are that have combined tubes, one central tube that is in the direction of the flow field, and then an outer tube that has holes perpendicular to the flow field. And when this is in the flow field, what you'll see is a higher pressure in that central tube and a lower pressure around it. That difference in pressure can be used to measure velocity. And this is a standard device used by all aircraft. They're called pitot tubes, and you can see one right here, and you can see the central hole and then a hole right on the side if you look really carefully. And these are used to measure, this is what's used to measure airspeed in aircraft. And aircraft usually have several of them um, and they're, they're very important devices. Okay, let's do an example taking advantage of these types of um, equations. Um, so I've got this flow down a pipe and it's connected to this wacky manometer. <clears throat> I'm going to pick two Bernoulli points, one and two, and write the Bernoulli equation at those two points. I picked points that are going to make use of that manometer. Um, they're at the same elevation, so I can cross up our elevations. And point two is the stagnation point, so I can set that equal to zero. Now I'm going to write a manometer equation. I have to define that height there, and you're going to have to go back to chapter two again to remember how we deal with manometers. So we start at one point, we start at point one, so the pressure at one equals something, and we just work our way around. So it's gamma water times the height of that water, which I just defined. We go up into the measuring fluid, another 2.5 uh, meters. Then we jump over to the other side and come back down and this is all in water and it's, since it's down it's negative and we come down that distance back to pressure 2. You can see that the, the H's cancel out thankfully because we don't know what, well, what height that is but they cancel out so it's not to worry about. 
and we can solve for the difference in pressure with that equation. Now this is kind of strange, this happens a lot in this, but we have two equations and three unknowns, both the pressures and the velocity. But we're actually able to solve this. We have enough information to solve right now because the pressures we can actually combine to a pressure difference and, and consider it a single variable. I'm going to do that with the Bernoulli equation. I'm going to rearrange so it's in terms of P1 minus P2 and then I can substitute the manometer equation into that. And If you look at that carefully now we only have one unknown. We just have the velocity. Um, we weren't given gamma for the measuring fluid. We were giving, given rho. So I'm going to calculate that. Gamma is rho g. This is one of those relationships you should have memorized. And that gives us a gamma for the measuring. Then we can look up a gamma for water, plug all those numbers in, and solve for velocity of 2.2 meters. Now the question asked for flow rate. As you know, flow rate is velocity times cross-sectional area and I'm going to skip the math there and just give you the answer. I'm sure you guys can handle that by now. So the flow rate is 0 0.0111 meters cubed per second. So that is Bernoulli. There's a lot of the Bernoulli equation is quite simple. What's hard is how to apply it and there's a lot of tricks you can remember to help you apply it. When you have large vessels, pick the water surface because pressure and velocity are equal to zero. With free jets, the pressure is zero, and don't forget Vienna Contracta. Um, mass balances are useful, manometers are useful, and st stagnation points are other good places to pick Bernoulli points because the velocity is zero there as well.